If you have an interest in horses and love learning more about horses, the horse industry, teaching, or even managing your own horse business, then you're in the right place. We would love you to join us on our mission, which is to improve the lives of horses around the world through the education of riders, handlers, and trainers. So get comfortable, listen in, and enjoy. This is another of our popular Listener's Choice interviews, which we're playing over the weekend. We've chosen the most popular interviews for you to select the Listener's Choice winner. If you're not sure how the Listener's Choice competition works, have a look at horsechats.com slash choice for the rules and the leaderboard. Hey, it's Glennis here. Just to let you know that even though the quality in this audio isn't first rate, the information certainly is. Please excuse the audio quality and focus on the education and what you'll learn in this interview. Today we're going to introduce Sally Ann Barbera. Sally's an FEI dressage rider. She also does show jumping and eventing. And we're going to speak to her today about generalised training for the dressage horse and the dressage rider. Sally is a specialised dressage coach, also teaches show jumping and eventing, is a general coach and coach educator. How are you today, Sally? I'm very well, thanks, Gurney. How are you? Oh, I'm very good. Sally, we normally start with a favourite quote. Have you got one for us today? Yes, I have prepared for this interview and I've found a couple that speak to me. One is from Winston Churchill, which is, sometimes it's not enough to do our best, we must do what is required. And I think that pretty much sums up a lot of the things that you have to do when you're training horses, when you're training riders, when you're training people to become coaches. You know, sometimes you've got to just doing your best isn't enough. You've got to do what's necessary to be done. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Can you give me an example of a time where you may have used this quote yourself or a time when you might have taught something, you know, taught your students about this? An example, I guess, would be in, say, coach education when there's a lot of um, a lot of young riders who are good young riders and they want to become coaches and there's parts of the syllabus that they don't see the need for doing. You know, they're not, it's, it's stuff they're not interested in. Often you'll find coaches who, they, they want to become coaches but they're not comfortable teaching groups. Mm-hmm. So, it's not, and that's what I mean, like, well, you have to do what's required because that's part of the syllabus to do it. And often if you can push people to do that sort of thing, they then learn more about themselves and they become better coaches in general. Yes, yes. And it's all right to say I'm never going to teach groups, but when you get invited out to a school to do a clinic, you might find a club that just can't afford or the riders can't afford to be individual riders and sometimes they do come as groups. That's right. Hmm. And and I think for riders, I think it is coaching that when you might have a horse that isn't the right horse for the job or, the horse, you know, he's not in the right job and you have to sell that horse, which is a wrench for a lot of people because, mm-hmm. you know, you get very poor horses. I think that's an example of where you might have to do what is required. Okay, if you yes. Want to yes, look at the end goal and do what's required, yes. It's like that, you know, you, you have to be prepared to make those tough decisions. Yep. Yeah. Yep. All right. Sally, can we talk about – oh, no, sorry, you had another quote. Oh, the other one. The other one was, you cannot push anyone up the ladder unless he's willing to climb. <laughs> that's and I, a, think, I think that's, that's within. I think that goes for riders, coaches and horses as well. Yes, yes. And I think that's one of the joys most of the time teaching riding as opposed to teaching in a school is that most of the time – People are there because they want to ride. They want to ride. They want to learn. Yeah, but, but also the horse may not necessarily want to be a dressage horse. Yes, yes, and the horse, so, has got, the horse has got to be ready and open as well. And if they've got, you know, nervousness or any other sort of hang-ups and not ready and open for that lesson, yeah. Yes, and, and that's what the horse to do is to try and make the horse want to do the job. That's the tough part of the job, isn't it? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, Sally, talking now about how you started with horses, can you tell us your earliest memories? My godmother started me riding horses in London Mm -hmm. and I was about three and I rode a a pony called Nicky and 
she started me off. She started off the horse addiction. There wasn't anybody in my family that was horsing, and she really started the ball rolling there. And so, yeah, I've got her to thank for that. Okay. Vicky was only a, a freshly broken two-year-old pony, can you believe it? <laughs> And she it was, it was a little Shetland pony and she sent me riding on him. And from there on in, I went to the pony and I just did anything I could to get around horses from there on in, really. And then going from there, because for a three-year-old, to becoming a professional instructor, professional person who works, trains with horses, what was the, the path? Was it one thing that made you become a professional instructor? Was it just a series of things? Was it something that you always wanted to do? It was something I always wanted to do. Uh, when I went for my school interview, the high school, and they said, what do you want to be? And I said, a show jumper, hmm. which wasn't looked upon as being any particularly, you know, most <laughs> of the people were saying doctors or lawyers, or, and I said, I want to be a show jumper. So I spent a lot of my childhood in London. Then we moved up to Lancashire when I was in primary school, and so we were surrounded by moorlands and fields and farms. And, and that was when I used to spend most of the day out and about just getting around farms where there were ponies and trying to beg rides, really, just anything to be around them and just, you know, working in riding schools. And then we moved back down to London and I was 11 and I rang a local riding school. It wasn't that local, it was sort of on the outskirts of London. And I rang a local riding school and asked for work. I mean, I was 11. I was terribly precocious, I think. Very, very ambitious. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> to go out there and and work from, um, you know, 6 o'clock in the morning to 6 o'clock at night for 50 pence. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah, that was that was me. And, and we led pony after pony after pony in, in lessons because it was, it was big riding school and they had all these lessons mm-hmm. and all these beginner riders and all of us kids would be charged with leading the ponies around. So I wrote, learnt how to teach. Okay. And I could parrot these lessons, really. And, of course, they didn't come from any space other than just being able to repeat what the instructor said. But it wasn't a bad start. Mm. You know, the lessons were very organised and very sort of ritualistic, if you like. So I got that sort of planning from there, you know. And then um, then I we moved out to Essex and then I got into show jumping and that was when I yeah, that's all I wanted to do was just be a show jumper. Okay. And you never went back and met the guidance officer who said who said it probably wasn't a professional career? No, no. No, I've never gone back and, and no. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I can remember my guidance officer. I said I wanted to work with horses and they weren't very impressed. Most of the time what they did was say, all right, dear, well, now you need to get an education because you need to have something to back you up. Yeah. Because it's not a well-paid career and I'm not a rich person and, and so on and so forth. So I think mm-hmm. they, they were all about all I wanted to do was spend time with horses. And then I did start riding for a show jumping dealer. Yes. And I, I rode for him and it, it was great because it got me into the show jumping scene. Mm-hmm. But you'd have horses that you didn't have them very long because obviously they were for sale and that was his business of selling them. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, and then what do you think are the skills to keep the, that have kept you in the horse industry? Because you teach a lot of young people now and some want to go on and work with horses. Some you can think that they're not going to make it, but others will. What are the skills, if you're going to employ someone, what are the skills that you're looking for? I think you've got to be completely obsessed at, at the best and maybe dedicated at the least. Yes, you know, yes. Yes. The rewards, if you're looking for rewards financially or winning at ribbons or prizes, or, the rewards are very little. You've got to be involved in the journey and the journey's got to all be enough for you, doesn't it? Because, yeah, there's not many accolades. I mean, there's, there's very few people get to the very pinnacle of the sport. So you've got to be totally dedicated and just want to fill your life with horses and be around horses, I guess. I think it goes back to one of those quotes that you said about pushing someone up the ladder. If people don't want to work with horses and aren't prepared to put the work in, they're not going to make yes. it. Yeah. yeah. No, no. And, you know, if, if I've got young girls that work for me as grooms, they are 
they're dedicated young people. You know, they, yeah. they want to they work with horses. They've also, I think one of your previous interviewees said something about they need to be a bit OCD, and I agree with that. You know, they've got to mm-hmm. take pride in um, or the, the stables look nice and tidy and the tack room is nice and tidy and it's clean and tidy. If, if they don't take pride in that side of the work, it's never going to work out. Yeah. Because it's the attention to detail that is so important, isn't it? Oh, definitely, definitely. Okay. Now, thinking about, you know, because you've learned those skills yourself, who, who's someone who's really influenced you in your career? There have been quite a few. I'd say when I first came here, one of my first show jumping instructors was Robert Stewart. Mm-hmm. And I'd show jumped in England, but I hadn't really been trained. It was a lot of seat to the pants stuff. And he was methodical and technical and yeah Robert Simon Kale has been a big influence in my life in as much as training and as a coach educator training me to be a coach and he still is a big influence in my life you know we talk most days and if I have any problems with students I'll often go back to Simon and he's quite a strong influence. I was going to say both both those people have been previous guests as well you know if people want to find out some more about them yep. Yes. Um, that yes, they, uh, Julie Pickett was another. When I came over here, I didn't event until I came to Australia, and she, her, it was her and Simon and Robert really who were. They coached me through all those eventing years. Okay. Um, and she, she was good. Okay. Yeah, she was a real influence. And then these day, oh, Richard Weiss. When I got into dressage, Richard was really changed the way I rode and teach and yeah he's been a huge influence yes mm. yes okay all right what about horses well I, I had a horse when I came here the first horse I bought here because when I first came to Australia I was gobsmacked at how cheap horses were <laughs> it's not the case now I bought this horse for 500 bucks and he was an unbroken horse of sort of uncertain parentage he was a uh, Thoroughbred, quite a thoroughbred stallion, but like a Clyde type cross mare was his mother. Yep, yep. And I vented him. And I did my level one on him. I borrowed him back to do my level two general because I, I did actually sell him. I took him to pre novice level. And that was one of those times as well when I was training with Julie Piggott and the horse had really reached his limit. And that was when she said it wasn't enough to do our best. We had to do what was required and what was required was really if I wanted to go on and do three-day eventing was to get another horse because uh-huh. I wasn't going to do it. But that horse made me feel I could jump anything. I could. I walked the course at Burley, the year I actually saw Simon ride around the Burley track. I walked that course and actually was that confident enough to think, I could do this. Mm. I reckon I could do this. Mm. <laughs> I never got the chance. But that was what that horse made me feel. What was his name? His name was Deke, and when I, I sold him on to a lady who started eventing and he took her through the grades and people would borrow him to do their level one. And I, I said he was the most educated instructor in the hall. He was this horse. <laughs> they would go do their, borrow him to do their exams. He was, God, he was a lovely horse, good horse. Okay, okay. And then my first FBI dressage horse, I got the ride on Northern Tresco and he was already gone probably when I got him and I learned a lot on that horse. Okay. You got into clinics, international riders and things because you were riding an FBI horse and I learned a lot on that horse. And, of course, my current horse at the moment, which is Harvest Aragorn, who I just got to Prince St George at the end of last year and I've had him since he's two and, and he's been amazing to okay. train with. Okay, good, good. What about your proudest moment? What's that been? I can't really pick a proud moment. I think I take a lot of pride in what my students do and I've taken a lot of pride in some of the coaches that we've produced and anything my kids do. Okay. I've got two sons and they're amazing. One proud moment I had recently was actually when a colleague said to me, you changed the way coach training was done in this country. Now, she didn't mean it in my sort of theoretical brilliant knowledge or anything like that because I started to run these courses and nobody was doing it and I put together this comprehensive this was back in the 90s yep. and I that was I was really proud of that when she said that I was like oh wow that, that was a huge compliment yep so 
Okay, I, I'd like you to think about coaching now and just think about a common coaching problem that you see and how to fix it, not just what the problem is. It might be your students, it might be you go to competitions and you see other students do this and we just want to talk about how to fix the problem as well. And this is to give our listeners a bit of an insight and to okay. increase their knowledge. I think a common problem that I see is people um, specialising too early in mm -hmm. their careers. Yep. And one of the big problems I see is young riders, or well, not even young riders, riders who are quite green themselves trying to put wheels on the bit okay. before actually mastered an independent position and good hands and the idea of contact. Mm -hmm. And I think in their rush to try and win at whatever, whether it's showing or dressage or whatever, but there seems to be this kind of, you know, you have to have a horse in a frame, you have to have a horse on the bit. And so often the riders see them, you know, their arms are straight and hands are down and they're wiggling the reins and wiggling the bit in the horse's mouth. And, and I think it's, it kind of ruins the rider's hands. So when they haven't learned how to follow the contact, they're trying to get horse on a bit before they've really got that fundamental knowledge of how to ride a horse forward straight. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a common coaching problem. Okay. And how to is basically the coaches have to concentrate on developing riders' positions, yes. you know, putting them on the making them ride without reins and stirrups and and working. And, and also coaches themselves, we all need to get more biomechanically aware and more educated about that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. That was something that I think Richard Lewis was really brilliant at and was a very untapped source in this country. Okay. I like the way you just said that, yeah, biomechanically aware, yeah. Because mm. mm. it's a dynamic thing. You know, people kind of think teaching good riding position, sit up, keep your hands still, put your heels down, and if it's not, it's way more than that because mm. there's a lot going on. It's a lot, a lot more depth, riding. yeah. Yeah. And riding is a very dynamic thing. So a rider is, appears to be sitting still. There's a lot going on. Mm. And it you know, isn't good enough to, to yell at people to put their heels down and keep, them, keep themselves still or keep their legs still. They have to be able to follow the movement and absorb the movement. And Yeah. Wait, can you hear anything? No. That's because we're waiting for someone with a good quality horse product to be advertised here. If that's you, then contact us. Horse chats at horsechats.com and we'll send you the details. Thanks. Now, going back to what we were talking about earlier, to do with generalised riding, you know, people specialising too early, you're doing a lot of pole work with dressage horses, dressage riders, and are you doing some outside work, introducing them to just going up and down hills and just getting the horses going forward? Or what's, what's the main – tell us a bit more about what you're doing there. Well, I think that all riders and all horses should, um, they need to vary their techniques. They need to be adaptable. They need to be, um, as I said, they specialise too early. So I think, you know, your jumpers don't necessarily want to go into the dressage arena and a lot of the dressage riders don't want to come out of the dressage arena. And I think that you really need cross-training. That was the word I was looking for. You need okay. to develop their idea about cross-training and that horses should be going out on trail rides and you should be riding over Angela. It doesn't mean to say that the riders, if they're worried, they don't need to be jumping tall buildings. They just need to be popping over things. A rider needs to be capable of riding in a forward set and going up and down hills, popping over small obstacles and remaining in balance. It's going to improve the rider's position and their confidence. It's going to improve the horse's confidence so what I've started to do is to do these pole training clinics because a lot of the time, you know, if you're by yourself, you may only have three or four poles at home and, and you can't be getting on and off the walls, putting the poles up and moving them and doing this. So I've started these groups of people so they come around and I'll build the, um, the poles and I do all the training. And where I get a lot of the exercises from is from the internet. There's a, a website called Horse Physio and they are – paid for a, a, a subscribe to it so you can get all these different amazing exercises you know fans of poles and canter poles and grids and all these sorts of things to make life a little bit more interesting for them and you do find that the rider's confidence by the end of the session is increased a lot 
Okay, okay. Now that's good to increase confidence, improve their position and make them more versatile. Yeah. Yeah. And I think we're seeing, I mean, Carl Hester is a big advocate of cross-training horses and doing different things and not drilling the horses in the arenas, you know, seven days a week. And it's, I think he's helped bring that awareness to people, as has Ingrid Pinker. Mm -hmm. All right. No, that's good. Have you got a book that you could recommend to our listeners? One of the books that really changed my life, I think, was uh, Centred Writing. Sally's uh-huh. book, Centred Writing. Were, yeah, I was going um, to say you like Richard, so that, that goes hand in yeah, hand, Sally. Yeah, and, yeah. 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 And, and, you know, some of the visualisation. I'm a very visual sort of learner, so for me some of those images that she would give you yep. were very helpful. I also like Real Life Dressage, which is by Carl Hester and Polly Ellison. And Carl's way of writing, I mean, everything, he's, uh, you know, he's my hero, really. And anything that he writes or does is, it's so easy to understand. You know, he doesn't talk in highfalutin dressage language. He makes it available to people, accessible. So I, I like his books. Mm-hmm. Good, good. And remember, you can find all the books recommended by our guests at horsechats.com slash books. You can have a look at the guest page for the individual book they recommended or just look at the recommended books by order of popularity at horsechats.com slash books. Sally, what are you looking forward to now? What I'm looking forward to is actually getting back into riding because I had an accident at the beginning of the year and I've been getting on horses and... um, or just two of mine, and just walking at the moment. I've done a little bit of trotting, but it's been a bit of a long road to get back on them. Mm-hmm. So what I'm looking forward to is to starting to get back to where I left off, which was having Harvey at Prince St. George. Good, good. So <laughs> <laughs> All right. And summing up your philosophy into a lesson today, would you be able to do that? I think my philosophy is about... I, on my website, I had this sort of thing at the bottom of each page. It said balance is the key. And that's kind of my philosophy about everything in riding and in life, both physically, you know, that, that obviously literal balance, like being a balanced rider and having a balanced horse is the key to success and having the horses on the bit going, you know, in the right, carrying you as a in the right way. But also I think balance in your life, and that's something that's, not always easy to achieve with horses because horses are such a time-consuming, all-absorbing hobby or profession, and and you need to have you need to have other things in your life as well. As your horse needs to be versatile, and you need to be versatile as a rider, I think you also need to be a little bit versatile as a person so that you can have a bit of a breakaway. Because if you've got other interests, it, it will also you can bring some of the aspects of your other interests into the horses and it just makes it a bit more, you just bring something else to the mix, you know what I mean? Mm, mm. All right. Sally, how can people contact you? My email is sallybarbera at bigpond.com. I've got a very out-of-date website, which is horsewise.com.au. Horsewise is the name of my business and the name of my courses and hopefully I will get that updated within the next few months because it's got some pictures on there that are, I don't look that young anymore. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And we'll also put those details on your page at horsechats.com slash Sally Ann Barbera. So those details will be yeah. there. And it's been great talking to you today. I've enjoyed listening to you about the polls and the cross-training and the discussion about the cross-training improving confidence and improving position and performance so hopefully that will give people something to go out and use and use on their horses yeah. be good that's my mission get dressage riders out of the arena and get show jumpers in the arena <laughs> all right thanks sally good to talk to you today bye thanks bye now if you're still there you probably know that i'm absolutely passionate about education within the horse industry That's why I host this podcast. My other venture is Online Horse College. Have a look now at onlinehorsecollege.com and I'll see you over there. Remember that our comments and instructions are general in nature and do not take into consideration your individual horses or your individual ability and circumstances. If you enjoyed this podcast, then please leave your comment below 